Thank you, Pastor Will. Um, this morning when I told my kids that I was coming up to New Life Pres in Fullerton, they wondered why they weren't coming with me. Uh, this church has a special place in our hearts, my wife, myself, as well as our kids. And uh, I had to tell them that I was actually recording and it will be streamed online. They were disappointed, but I just wanted you to know how much you're in our hearts. And for someone like me, it's a delight and a great joy for me to be joining you in worship albeit over uh, this medium. One day I hope that we can see each other face to face and greet one another again that way. I also want to bring greetings and thanks from Westminster Seminary, California, the institution that I have the privilege of serving. You have been such a wonderful partner to us. Um, seminary exists for churches, not the other way around. And it's been true with New Life Press here. Grateful for you. And we ask for your continued prayers for us as we navigate some of the changes that are happening even as we speak, and as we also uh, finish out the year and the fundraising that's before us as well. We remain so grateful for you, and we pray for you regularly as well. Would you turn with me this morning to Psalm chapter 3? Psalm chapter 3, and this will be the Lord's word for us this morning. So hear now the word of the Lord. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the, on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. So far, the reading of his word. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your kindness to us in your providing and protecting all your people, even in the midst of many challenges and changes. But we come to your home this morning, expecting to hear from you. We ask that you open up your word so that you will not only ch challenge our hearts and our minds, but that you'll build in us trust in you, that all that we do, all that we endeavor to do, may bring glory and honor to your name. For we pray these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For those of you who know me well, um, many of you know that I struggle with sleep. Sleep comes in difficult fits, and one is prayerful of the need for rest along the way. And so perhaps for that reason and personal one, this particular quote from a recent book st struck my heart and made me remember this quite well. In a recent book called The Splendid and the Vile, is a book about Winston Churchill and the United Kingdom, really about the time when the Blitz was taking place and a merciless air raid was taking place over the city of London by German Nazis, when the U.S. declared war on Japan and Germany after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And Churchill was assured of the help that his country needed, something that he was seeking and praying for for some time. The author, Eric Larson, actually records a portion of what Churchill said and recorded in his own diary. Larson records, later that night, Churchill retired to his room. Quote, being saturated and satiated with emotion and sensation, he, that is, Churchill wrote, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved and the thankful. I really like that phrase. He slept the sleep of the saved and the thankful. Do you know what it means? And have you experienced this sleep of the saved and the thankful? Perhaps if you're like me, we are more prone to experience the sleeplessness of the worried and the overwhelmed, the discontent 
as well as those who are unsure and uncertain about the future. Whether the cause is the coronavirus and the now stay-at-home order that many of us in San Diego and Orange County are experiencing, racial injustice around the country, financial instability, concerns about education for our children, uncertainties about our own future, religious opposition from the general public, political chaos, all these things and many more, keep us up at night. Perhaps not just me, many of you as well. If that is the case, Psalm 3 is for you. Psalm 3 is for those of us who are fearful, overwhelmed, and sleep-deprived as we identify with the psalmist who honestly displays his sorrow. He trusts in the shield, rests in the safety, and praises the Savior. Sorrow, shield, safety, and the Savior. Verses 1 and 2 indicate how sorrowful the psalmist is when he says, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Did you know? David knew something about worries and sorrows. Perhaps the title of our psalm gives us a clue when it begins by saying, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. He fled from Epsalom, his son. When David was occupied with governing the nation, his son Absalom stole the hearts of the people and raised a rebellion in the nearby town of Hebron. The revolt was so sudden and unexpected that David had no recourse but to actually leave and flee to Jerusalem with whatever leaders remained faithful to him. The historical account reminds us that he retreated to the safety of the desert Weeping, according to 1 Samuel, weeping and barefoot, his head covered in sorrow. Weeping and barefoot, his head covered in sorrow. Uh, This is a dark hour for David. He writes not only of his son's betrayal, which was painful in and of itself, but of the opposition of the many, or as the verse 6 indicates, many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. He writes not only for his own safety and deliverance, but remembers the precarious state of his own people, calling for the blessing of the Lord to be upon his people, verse 8. He writes not only for self-indication, that is, he be recognized by all as being innocent in this, but for the Lord to be vindicated as rumors abounded that the Lord hath withdrawn himself from David and his people. Many were saying, as verse 2 indicates, there is no salvation for him in God. Many, many, many are the repeated words. You can even say much, much, much is happening all around him. As he looks within and all around, David cannot help but feel hopeless, powerless, and scared. Perhaps you can identify with this. This psalm does not cover up the emotions, but lends voice and words to how many of us feel. As if 2020 wasn't already bad enough, we this week in Escondido, California, where our school is located and where my family lives, we had a blackout for almost 24 hours, some even longer primarily because they were concerned about the Santa Ana winds and wanting to uh, uh, prevent wildfires turned off all electricity in our area. And here, as soon as the lights went off, concerns grew. It almost seemed like overwhelming in terms of number of challenges that we had. Perhaps Psalm 137 indicates the way we feel about things There, when the Israelites were taken as captives, and when the captors and the enemies were taking them to a place where they will be exiled for some time as captives, and when the enemies among them actually chided them and actually encouraged them to sing the song, they would have felt uh, free to sing in their hometown. In this scene of mockery, here the psalmist records simply saying in 137.4, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How shall we sing the Lord's song 
in a foreign land. And often it feels like that these days. We recognize that this is not our home. We are journeying not in our home, but away from home. And there we're trying to find grace, contentment, and joy in a foreign land. And here, we cannot help but to echo the words, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land like the one in which we find ourselves? This is where verses 3 through 6 remind us of our real state. Verses 3 and 4 say, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. My glory and the lifter of my head, I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. But you, O Lord. I love this phrase, but you, O Lord. It makes the contrast between me and God explicit and ever clear. What I cannot, he can. As one commentator says, when a believer gazes too long at his circumstances and opposition, the force arrayed against him seems to grow in size until it appears to be overwhelming. But when he turns his thoughts to God, God is seen in his true great stature, and the enemies shrink to manageable proportions. I wonder if you've experienced that. Here, the psalmist is reminding us of who God is. Who is the Lord? We are told he's a shield about me. Shield is a common metaphor for protection, often used of God as he protects his people. Psalm 710 says, My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. Psalm 18, 1 and 2 say, I love you, O Lord, my strength. This was actually the psalm that was on the wall of my parents' home every single day of my life. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. When Mulan came out earlier this year, children, um, The Kim family in Escondido uh, did not watch it then because we couldn't afford it. No, kidding. We just chose to wait until it was going to be released for popular audience. And so we just saw it on Friday night. We usually try to have a, a family night on Friday nights. And so we watched it on Friday. My daughter, Anna, was convinced it was going to be a bad movie because the reviews were horrible. I actually quite much enjoyed it. It was, I thought it was a very good movie, and I enjoyed the movie from beginning to the end as someone here shakes his head. But there's this one scene you might remember where the, 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 the good people, uh, the empire folks here try to protect themselves by putting shields up as that witch figure was trying to attack them. Now, it didn't protect them that well, but you may imagine the scene where the shield covers the people both around and over. In the movie, later on, they were destroyed. But in the spiritual sense of Psalm 3, this cannot be destroyed. Perhaps a bad analogy for me to work with. But here, it's that notion of the shield covering all of us. This shield is about me. The imagery of complete protection. The large shield was big enough to protect not only parts of our body, but the whole body from the enemy's sword or arrows. The Lord is our shield who covers us, about us, we're told, in full protection. Perhaps naturally, David, therefore, turns to the only one who protects, the only one who preserves, the only one who can give confidence in circumstances that are overwhelming. And so he turns to him by saying, I cried to the Lord. I cried to the Lord. It's a proof of faith that a believer turns to the Lord in prayer, even and perhaps especially in moments of despair and weakness. When Jehoshaphat faced the great army assembled against him and his people in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3, we are told that he was afraid. 
But then he, along with his people, immediately set their face to seek the Lord. And you may remember the prayer very well that's recorded for us in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12, where he prayed, We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I don't know how many times we prayed these pra- this prayer this year alone. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, as one commentator says. And certainly the only remedy for allaying our fears is this, to cast upon him all the cares which trouble us, as on the other hand, those who have the conviction that they are the objects of his regard must be prostrated and overwhelmed by the calamities which befall them. Now, I must confess When these challenges, many and many and much and much are before me, my immediate reaction is not one of prayer, but oftentimes seeking solution. Frankly, many of us, and my guess is many of us in New Life Press Fullerton here, many are probably overeducated, overcompetent, and oversufficient before the Lord. The Lord says, we turn to him who is our shield and our protector. So in the midst of this sorrow, in the midst of this shield that the Lord is for us, we recognize and experience the safety he promises. David's response is given in two movements in verses five and six. I lay down and slept. That's what he did. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. This is the heart of this psalm and the part that many find most attractive about Psalm 3. Here is the confidence of a believer who trusts in the Lord. There is a night of rest involved here despite all danger and opposition. Note here very well, nothing has changed Many are still against him. Much is happening around him. It's not when the Lord delivered them fully and that we see trouble in our rear view window that we turn to the Lord and trust and and lay down to sleep. It's in the midst of them. He lay down and slept. David is able to do what all of us desire to do, rest. This is not about fatigue or David's easygoing personality. It's all about faith and trust in God who is in charge. You may recall from Psalm 121, verses 3 and 4, where it says, He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now, the translation is great here in ESV when it talks about keeps and keeping us. In the NIV, uh, the older version that many of us grew up with actually has a more intimate imagery of the Lord watching over you. He neither sleeps nor slumbers, but always watches over you. Do you know how that feels like, right? Our children don't recognize how much the parents love them often. When they were initially born, especially for us, with our firstborn, uh, there is this sense of responsibility as first-time parents, and we often walked into our children's rooms to check that they're alive. I, I don't know if the parents know what that feels like. When she's sleeping, that is my, uh, f- our first child daughter, we would go in in the middle of the night, like 2 o'clock, and we will check her nostril like this just to see her breathing we will stand on the side of her to see her heart going up and down pumping. And oftentimes, we're not satisfied with those things alone, so we would push her, uh, (laughs) risking her waking up just to see her stir to make sure that she's actually alive. If you take away the anxiety and the neurosis, that's God. God is right now, as always, watching over you. You may not see it. You may not know it, just like our children never recognized that their parents were in their room. But he is watching over you. This is the sleep of the saved and the thankful. 
The Lord's deliverance was not given yet, but yet we recognize it was inevitable. And therefore, we rely upon him and rest in his arms. And he says, I will not be afraid. No fear. That's not a tagline or a motto of a company. I will not be afraid. Fear not is repeated over 80 times in the Bible. It's con- contrasted with faith. This is not because of our own innate abilities to resolve or to overcome. This is also not because of some aid or help expected and anticipated from others or other organizations or entities, but it's simply because of God. God's unchanging promise is to be with his people, and there is no circumstance, no future, no opposition that is beyond his power and his grace. He says today, I am here with you, and you can trust in me. Trusting and having no fear really are easier said than done. Uh, I hope it's not just me. Um, It's often very difficult, and I think this year, in the Lord's pruning process of those of us who belong to him this year, many of us were challenged to recognize in what or in whom we place our trust. Um, Here I am. I'm a man pleaser uh, who who regularly disappoints people as many decisions are made uh, this year. I am told that leadership is disappointing people at a rate that they can actually withstand. And I've done that really well this year um, in terms of the decisions. Here I am, someone who really seeks security financially and to be in a position where you're always dependent on the Lord's provisions through his people. Here I am, someone who's prideful, uh, really thinking well or uh, a high regard for myself, who has to die to self each and every single day as we try to figure out a way forward. But here, this is where the Lord is reminding us, friends, you may rest. Trust that things will be well. Not because we're positive thinkers. Not because the solution will come up when the sun comes up in the morning. But simply because Our hope and trust are built upon God's promises and his faithfulness to us. Do you remember God's promise? Let me repeat one verse for you in Isaiah 43. He says, but now, you guys read it earlier today, actually. Thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob. He who formed you, O Israel, fear not. Fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. This is what God says. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be buried. Uh, When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. Fear not, for I am with you. Listen to what he says. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, fear not, for I am with you. This is the Lord's safety that he promises. Not because we are lovable, but because he's faithful to us. This is where The psalmist then leads us to the conclusion here in Psalm 3, verses 7 and 8. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you strike all the enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. It's a cry, isn't it? Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. God caused Absalom, if I may finish the story of what happened with David, he caused Absalom to listen to bad advice and thus fail to pursue and defeat his father when his father was most vulnerable. Then when the battle was finally engaged, after David had been able to gather strength and prepare for it, David's troops achieved a great victory, contrary to what people were expecting, even ultimately killing Absalom, his son. 
This is a cry, not just simply of need and desire. It's a cry of victory. Not simply asking for salvation, but knowing that salvation is inevitable because the object to whom we do cry, knowing that the Lord was going before them and would lead to victory. It is the unflinching trust in the truth that God will ultimately make right the wrong. He will be just in the midst of injustice. He will make us whole in the midst of brokenness around us. Even death cannot overcome him. He brings salvation in the midst of death itself. Thus leading to the testimony when he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It's not just an Old Testament testimony. It's a testimony of all believers, not only at the beginning, but till the end. For we're told in Colossians 1, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, son Jesus Christ who lived and died and resurrected on our behalf. And what we have here is not only a positional change before God, no longer condemned as sinful, now called his sons and daughters, but the promise of where we will be, one day being at home with him. What Christ has achieved for us and before us cannot change and cannot be overturned, thus leading to people singing with praise, even at the end, Revelation 7.10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Revelation 19.1, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. What we're doing this morning in worship, whether in person or online, is confessing this confession that is true because of Jesus Christ. We are echoing the words of many voices, both past and future, in being able to say, salvation belongs to God in Christ Jesus, and his deliverance is certain because of his faithfulness to his people. And what began as sorrow in Psalm 3 is transformed into trust and singing of joy. Not because of any change in us, and certainly not because of the changes in the circumstances, because the one who oversees all these things does not change. Friends, I'm not exactly sure where you are, um, not only physically, but emotionally. Um, certainly, I don't know exactly where you have been. And even just hearing the prayers this morning from our elder Alex, recognizing that many who are either in pain of body or soul, the darkness of future and past burdens that they have, and especially for many of you who may not know this peace and trust no fear that can come to us in Christ Jesus because you have not accepted him as your savior yet. All these things are realities I realize that many of you are experiencing. But this is where the psalmist wants us to remember God is able to save and deliver and he will never withdraw his grace and blessings from you and the church. No matter the many and the much that are around us. You guys recited the Heidelberg Catechism earlier. I want to recite another part of the Heidelberg Catechism, Q&A 28. The question is, how does the knowledge of God's providence, that is, God providing daily by determining for us how our days ought to be, how does his providence help us? And the answer he gives, or at least the, uh, the catechism gives, is this. We can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and for the future, we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature will separate us from his love. For all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. Patient in adversity, knowing that the Lord is in charge, Thankful in prosperity, knowing that you have not done it, but the Lord has done it. 
and for the future have good confidence, not because of our faithfulness, but God's faithfulness to us, that nothing and no one can separate us from his love in Christ Jesus. May the Lord, friends, guard you and guide you as you navigate not only for yourself, but for your family and children and for your workplaces, the challenges that are so many around us. Even as we absorb and think about the news of the stay at home in our area that came down last night, I pray that the Lord will give you no fear, but Lord will overflow you with trust, recognizing that he will guide and provide. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we confess to you this morning that oftentimes our faith is weak, and often our minds are filled instead of confidence and trust, filled with despair and concerns. And Lord, uh, we, we, we acknowledge and recognize that many challenges are overwhelming for us, but none of this overwhelms you. And so, Lord, we lean upon your grace this morning, trust in the promises given and made to us that you will provide us with safety and protection, that you will provide us with overabundance of provision, that you will continue to go before us and be with us in your presence, O Lord, not because of our own merited favor, but simply because of your kindness to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, Lord, we come to you with prayer simply saying, we don't know, but, Lord, our eyes are fixated upon you. Lead us. Go before us. Cover us as a shield. Take away our fear, but allow us to trust in you always. Grant to us the rest that all of us need. Lord, the rest that only the saved and thankful can truly taste and understand. For we pray all these things in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.